Yeah, I think we have the recording now, so we can begin. So we're starting off with the book of Nahum. Um, Nahum basically is a judgment made against the um, city of Nineveh. Now, if you remember, when we were looking at Obadiah, Obadiah was a judgment against whom? Let's see if anyone is awake. When we did the book of Obadiah, that was a judgment against the Edomites. So now here, Nahum is actually a judgment being spoken against uh, the city of Nineveh. Last week, when we were looking at the book of Jonah, we saw that God actually wanted to give them a chance to repent, you know, come into his kingdom, be a part of his people. So he gave them that chance. And for a few years, uh, many of the Ninevites did turn to the living God. But then a uh, majority of them went back to their old ways, is what we are assuming, because, uh, you know, Tiglath Pileser is able to uh, defeat them. And they no longer have Yahweh's support at that point of time. So we assume that most of them must have gone back to their idolatrous ways. Some of them, however, do remain in the kingdom of God because Jesus talks about how there will be people from Nineveh uh, who will stand up during the judgment time and, ju and speak judgment against the people who are refusing Jesus. Because Jesus is a greater prophet than Jonah, if those people were willing to listen to Jonah and uh, come to the living God, uh, then these cities in Jesus' time have no excuse because Jesus is a greater prophet than Jonah and uh, the people of Jesus' day were still rejecting him. So uh, this is the background which we saw regarding Nineveh last time when we covered um, you know, the book of Jonah. So today we will look at what happens to Nineveh later uh, and, the, and the judgment which came upon them when they returned back to their idolatry. All right, so um, uh, this prophet Nahum uh, is a contemporary of Zephaniah and Jeremiah. So around the time that Jeremiah and Zephaniah were having their ministries, um, at that time you have even Nahum prophesying. Uh, but his concern is not so much about the destruction of Jerusalem, which is going to happen soon. His uh, prophecy is concentrating on how Nineveh also will be destroyed one day. Uh, so uh, just to know a little bit of background regarding the time of Nahum, uh, we see that he was doing his ministry um, at the time of Josiah, the good king, Josiah. Uh, so. Um, we could have any one person read out for us. Nahum chapter 1, verse 15. Let us look at what God has to say regarding this time of uh, Josiah. Nahum chapter 1, verse 15. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidding, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feet, perform your vows for the weak oneself no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. All right. So here we see um, God telling the people, celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. So this is during the time of the good king Josiah, who has tried to bring about a spiritual revival. He is trying to follow the ways of God. And so at this time, for a little while, the kingdom of Judah is allowed to have peace because these are people who are trying to come back to the Lord, trying to walk in the Lord's ways. So even though judgment is going to come down, for a few years during this time of Josiah, the Lord allows the kingdom to enjoy peace because the people have turned their hearts towards him. So we see that this is the setting in which Nahum is giving a prophecy against Nineveh. Um, now in 722 is when uh, Assyria had destroyed uh, the northern kingdom. At that time, if you remember, even 
the cities of the southern kingdom some of the cities were also attacked some of the cities were also taken over um that were that was in 701 bc so around that time these events had taken place the assyrians had shown how powerful they are and so now god speaks a judgment against them and says yes it is true that you were able to come and destroy the northern kingdom yes it is also true that you came a few years later and attacked the cities of the southern kingdom during the time of hezekiah at which time you did have a lot of success so yes you are powerful but this is what i the almighty one is selling that you nineveh will also fall when your time of punishment comes so that is what god is declaring over here and uh, so it is in 612 bc that nineveh completely falls so uh, nineveh as we know is the capital of the assyrian kingdom uh, it was not the capital during the time of jona but then now 150 years have passed by and now um, at this time nineveh is the capital of the assyrian kingdom and this is god's prophecy against it uh, looking to look at the structure of the book of nahum there are only three chapters and we see in the first chapter that god talks about his great power and he talks about the judgment which he is capable of bringing and then in the next two chapters you have details about how nineveh will be attacked how nineveh will be uh, destroyed so maybe we can have um, maybe we can look at maybe one verse from chapter 1 which talks about the awesome great power of the living god um if we could have someone read out for us nahum chapter 1 verse 5 Now, whom one five? The mountains quake before him; the hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Here, it's using poetic language. It's talking about how the mountains will literally shake when God comes in His anger to judge. and this is a statement made at the end of this verse where it says the world and all the inhabitants in it you know they are the ones who will be completely um judged so the lord is saying when i come to bring my judgment it doesn't matter how powerful nineveh is going to be it will be brought down and so this is what god says re- specifically regarding nineveh in uh, chapter 3 verse 7 god talks about complete destruction of nineveh so if we can have someone read out for us nahum chapter 3 verse 7 it shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say nineveh is laid waste who will they mourn her where shall i seek comforters for you now nineveh was a powerful capital so it had a lot of allies all the other kingdoms wanted to be you know, to partner with it to be friends with it because it was in a powerful state but god says i will reduce it to a state where nobody will want to even come near you you will no longer have any supporters you will no longer have anyone even uh feeling sorry for the destruction which you have undergone so god says that that is what i will do to nineveh one day uh, and so the verse says nineveh is devastated who will grieve for her where will i seek comforters for you nobody will even want to come forward and help nineveh in the time of destruction so this is the kind of destruction that god speaks against a powerful nation which has attacked northern Uh, uh the northern kingdom which has also successfully taken over many of the southern kingdom's cities and these are god's words against it um now just to look at a little bit of background um if you remember we talked about how uh 150 years previously when jona was asked to give uh, a word of judgment to nineveh at that time Nineveh was just a provincial center it was not the capital city and moreover the dynasty that was ruling at that time the Assyrian dynasty that was ruling at that time 
did not have many powerful rulers. There was a person named Shamshi Adad on the throne. And then after him, his three sons, they come. None of them are powerful. So uh, the, the, at that time, all the provincial centers are trying to break free from the Assyrian control. Things were like that. But then after that, we, you know, we talked about it last time. Tiglath Pileser's dynasty comes. And his dynasty is very powerful. And that's basically when uh, you have uh, the Assyrian Empire regaining its strength. It becomes strong once again. So during the time of Tiglath Pileser, uh, is when you have a series of powerful rulers, one of them being um, Sargon II. Around the ending of his reign, he and Senna Sherib, they come. They destroy the northern kingdom take away all the Israelite uh, people from there as slaves. And so the Senna Sherib, he becomes one of the most powerful rulers. And so while some people say that Tiglath Pileser made uh, Nineveh the capital, many other historical records, they say that it was actually Senna Sherib who expanded Nineveh and made it his capital city. So he builds for himself a very grand palace in Nineveh. And he, in fact, builds a palace even for his uh, son. And he builds a large fortification wall around Nineveh. And it's told that um, that city now had some 1,850 acres. So it was supposed to be a large city. He expands the city, makes it bigger, grander. Uh, he puts in a lot of gardens and all of that. And then uh, one of his descendants, Ashur Banipal, he's another very, very powerful Assyrian king. Uh, so he also, you know, um, uh, constructs many palaces and all of that. So Nineveh becomes a very grand city. And people look upon it as a successful uh, place. They don't think about it as a weak place. But God says, even though you have become such a grand and powerful city, I will bring you down when the time comes. Um, what we learn about this last dynasty of the Assyrians is that they, are, they, were, they were a very cruel people. The Assyrians were a violent nation. Uh, their soldiers always were violent. But this last dynasty is especially very, very cruel and heartless. Uh, because in the historical records which are available, uh, we see some of the very evil things which they did. In fact, in Nahum chapter 3, verse 1, when God is describing the city, he calls it city of blood. Um, maybe we, someone could read out Nahum chapter 3, verse 1. Nahum 3, verse 1. Go to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. It says that this is a city of blood. It's full of blood. It is full of lies. It is full of exploitation and plunder. It's always constantly attacking its victims. That is the description which is given for this city of Nineveh. And this was the city to which God reached out his hand and said, if you will repent, I would like to take you under my covering. But now the people have gone far away from that repentance. And this is what they have become. They have become a city of blood. So uh, not only did Nineveh backslide, it has now gone to a stage where it is completely no way connected to Yahweh anymore. That is what has happened to Nineveh under the uh, you know, rule of this third dynasty, under the rule of this powerful third dynasty. And uh, so... During the time of Sargon II and Senna Sherib, when northern Israel is being conquered, this is what they do to Manasseh. This is how Manasseh is dragged away. Uh, if someone could read out the description of how Manasseh is defeated and how he is taken away, you know, when northern uh, when the northern kingdom is falling. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter thirty-three, verse eleven. Second Chronicles thirty-three, verse eleven.
11. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. It talks about how they put a hook in his nose and dragged him off, like as if he is an animal. The idea is that um, the you know Assyrian kings are saying, "Look, once upon a time you were a king, but now we have reduced you to the level of an animal. We have reduced you to the level of a beast. The same way we 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 carry uh, you know we 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 drag cattle by putting a hook in their nose." in that way we are putting a hook in your nose and dra dragging you away to our kingdom so uh, in this manner they would humiliate the kings whom they were conquering now they didn't exactly have any surgical instruments nor surgical procedures in those days so you can imagine how violently that metal hook would have been placed in a human nose and a person is actually dragged using that so it is brutal no sense of mercy or kindness uh, you know so that's the kind of record that we see even in the secular writings regarding the uh, assyrian third dynasty in fact uh, we also see in the historical records mention being made that um, when they would capture the kings and the uh, and the powerful officials of the of the different kingdoms they would put them on the ground you know uh, facing with the face downward on the ground and then they would slice the skin along the back uh, so that they can peel off the entire thing like as if it's one single you know layer that was the level of cruelty i mean when the person is still alive they would start peeling off his flesh so that they can display this flesh which they have taken off from the person you know the same way you would do with animals where animal the way the animal is uh, uh, skin is carefully cut open and sliced open so that you know the whole thing comes open like one single piece and um, um, that is what they used to do to the people whom they have uh, to some of the powerful officials and kings whom they have captured um, now uh, when god finally destroyed this city he promised he said that it will be devastated that it will be so completely destroyed that nobody will even live in that place anymore that was the promise that god made and uh, just according to that prophecy you know nobody ever lived in that area any longer after the uh, destruction of nineveh and it was only in the mid 1800s that archaeologists even discovered that there was such a city existing you know under the ground uh, so when they began to do explorations in that excavations in that particular region that is when in the mid 1800s they discovered this large grand city they began to excavate all the palaces which were there and then they saw how grandly those palaces were constructed um they had this huge large um stone slabs you know in the palace on which they would carve out their history they would make carvings about how they defeated enemies how they tortured the enemies all these are shown in the carvings which they uh, you know did in on those large wall uh, slabs so that's in fact available in uh, some museum somewhere i'm not sure where uh, so those things are still displayed up to this day and if when you look at those carvings or you know which have been taken from the palace walls then you will see the level of their cruelty they were proud to advertise that this is how they treat their enemies uh, so you in fact you have one carving in which uh, you know it's it's it, that, that particular carving is celebrating the victory which they had at uh, which they had won at elam and so you basically have ashur banipal and his wife sitting over there uh, along with all the officials and they are having a huge banquet they are all feasting and drinking wine and all of that and then in the corner you have uh, you know from the tree the head of the elamite king hanging you know like, like a decoration piece so they wanted to show off in their drawings 
you know, in their carvings, how great they were and how they have reduced every, all the other kings to you know, nothing. And uh, so that was the kind of um, cruelty that we see in this uh, Assyrian dynasty. And God says to them that he will bring them down and that when the destruction comes, nothing will be able to save them. Um, maybe we can look at some details about uh, the actual attack, uh, which are mentioned in poetic language in the Bible. And then we can compare it to the historical records that we have about uh, actually how Nineveh fell. Um, so if we could maybe first read out the scripture passage, uh, Nahum chapter 2, if someone could read out verses 4, 5, and 6. Nahum chapter 2, verses 4, 5, and 6. The carriers raced in the street. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. He remembers his novels. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to her walls. And the defense is prepared. The gates of the river are open. And the palace is dissolved. So in these verses, you have poetic language being used to talk about how Nineveh is going to fall one day. Okay, this is the prophecy that is being given. It has not yet happened. But here in this prophecy, God describes, this is how I will bring about your destruction. And when we read these wordings, we don't quite understand what is being talked about over here. But then when we compare this with what the Greek historian um, Cyculeus wrote down in his historical record. Then we begin to understand what these verses are saying. So there was this Greek historian uh, named Diodorus uh, Cyculus, um, S-I-C-U-L-U-S, that was his name. Uh, and he wrote something called the Bibliotheca Historia. And so in his history book, you know, that word Bibliotheca Historia literally means history book. So in his history book, he talks about the capture of Nineveh and how Nineveh falls. Um, uh, it is basically the, the Medes and the Babylonians who come and attack the city. And this is actually what happens. Um, Sena Sherib we saw build, expanded the size of the original city and he built a new fortification wall. So earlier when Nineveh was there in the time of Jonah, they had a city and they already had a fortified wall around it. But then he expands the city. So, so he makes the city much bigger in size. So the original fortification wall stays inside. But now the city has become much bigger in size, extending beyond those fortification walls. And so now you have an other outer fortification wall. So Nineveh now basically has two levels of walls. You have the wall which is inside the original wall. And then you also have an outer um, uh, wall, which is uh, at a much many, many kilometers away. Because now that entire circumference of the city has increased. And so they had two levels of fortification walls. And when, they, when the Medes and the Babylonians come to attack, they find it very, very difficult to break through the outer walls. Uh, because, you know, um, the soldiers who are attacking from inside, who are standing on the walls and fighting, are in a strong position. And the Medes and the Babylonians on that day, when they first come and make their attack, they're not able to have any success. Uh, in fact, they're quite badly defeated. The Nineveh soldiers who are standing on the battlement, you know, walls, they throw arrows at them, they throw uh, uh, huge rocks at them. And so the enemy is unable to come inside those outer fortification walls. This is the, what is recorded in uh, Cyculus, you know, uh, writings. This is what he says about the first attack. So that night, there's a great celebration inside the city of Nineveh because the enemy was unable to get inside. The people were able to, you know, the soldiers were able to defeat the Medes and the Babylonians. So that night, they have a huge celebration and um, Cyculus writes that they all got very drunk. So when they were in that drunken state, 
at that time in the night the medes and the babylonians take advantage of the situation and secretly during the night they are able to make an opening in one portion of that outer wall and they are able to enter inside along with their chariots through that broken portion because all the officials and all the commanders of the army everyone is drunk on the inside and they are not alert so this is what basically is talked about over here in nahum chapter 2 verse 4 where it talks about how the chariots are storming through the streets they are rushing back and forth through the squares they look like flaming torches they dart about like lightning those are the wordings that are used in the scripture in chapter 2 verse 4 so it's basically talking about how the chariots have now broken through the outer wall they have entered into nineveh and now the chariots are moving around in the sunlight and when the ninevites when the ninevites wake up in the morning they are horrified to see these chariots moving about and it says they look like flaming torches you know because these uh, chariots are made of uh, metal and they are shining in the sunlight and so when they are uh, you know passing by it looks like as if you know um, the 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 metal is catching fire because of the sunlight which is falling upon it and so poetic language is being used and then what does nineveh what do the what do the soldiers do verse 5 it says nineveh summons her picked troops yet they stumble on their way they dash to the city wall the protective shield is put in place so now all the soldiers realize that the outer wall has been breached so now they start rushing towards the inner city wall and so they put up defenses around the inner city wall hoping that at least they can now protect what is left of the actual main inner city so it talks about how the protective shield is put in place in um, chapter 2 verse 5 so um, the outer wall has been broken through and now the uh, medes and the babylonians need to attack the inner wall and now the soldiers are completely on their guard the ninevite soldiers are completely on their guard and uh, it will not be very easy now for the enemy to attack so now they come up with another plan and it, that gets described in verse 6 where it says the river gates are thrown open and the palace collapses what is it talking about over here the river tigris passed through one small portion of the city of nineveh so in one corner of the city you actually have the river tigris going through the city so the the inner wall was constructed in such a way that the waters go under the um, they go under the city wall into the city at one particular portion and during the rainy season you know the, the rivers tend to become um, over flooded and so to prevent flooding inside the city in the outer area of the city sena sherib he constructs you know dam gates the way we have today in our you know current water dams where you can open the gates to allow the water to flood you know with all of its power or you can close the gates uh, where you know they are called sluice gates the dams have something called sluice gates when you close the gates the water flow reduces when you open the sluice gates the water flow increases so they were controlling the flow of water into the city using these sluice gates so basically what the enemy does once it comes inside inside the outer wall you know once they make the entry through the outer wall they open up the sluice gates and the waters rush into the inner city and as the waters are rushing into the inner city this one portion of the wall which is weak um, which is supposed to be on the northern north eastern side and that portion of the inner wall collapses and all the enemy goes in through that broken portion and once they go inside um the king who is there you know inside the, the in his palace when he hears that the inner wall has also been broken down he burns down the entire palace with the entire royal family inside his idea is that they have humiliated so many other kings and nations now the enemies are going to do that to them and he doesn't want to face that humiliation so he literally burns all his wives 
his children, everyone inside the palace. He sets it on fire so that the entire palace just burns and collapses and the enemy comes and takes over the entire city. So these are some, uh, some of the details that we find in the writings of Cyculus, who records the downfall of uh, Nineveh. So just as God prophesied, the river gates are opened. Just as God prophesied, the palace collapses. So all these things God predicts even before these events take place. And it's about only 600 years later, after the fall of Nineveh, that Cyculus writes down these details in his historical record. All of this shows that we truly have a living God who looks into the future and tells us beforehand what is going to take place. So this is not a God that you know the nation should take lightly. This is the living God who knows the end from the beginning. And so uh, uh, the nations must actually you know, pay attention. So all of these prophecies were given so that the nations will realize that Yahweh is all powerful. He's aware of future events. When he makes a prophecy of judgment, it shall come to pass in his perfect timing. So these are all facts which um, uh, the prophets were trying to convey, you know, whenever they proclaimed these prophecies. Um, so these are some of the details that we see regarding the fall of Nineveh. So when we look at the poetic language in the book of Nahum, we don't get quite, we don't get all the historical details. But when we back it up with what Cyculus has written, we see that God made this happen. When you look at just the historical writing which Cyculus wrote, he writes as if the Medes and the Babylonians were powerful enough to do this on their own. But it's actually a living God who allowed them to do this to Nineveh. He's the one, he's the power behind these Medes and Babylonians who are able to you know, bring judgment on Nineveh. So when you just look at the historical books, it looks like a series of events. Powerful people rise, powerful people fall. But it's actually the living God who is controlling these powerful people and allowing them to rise and causing them to fall in his time, according to his you know, uh, plan. And so even as we see some of the things which are happening in the world today, you know, in the, uh, when we look at the uh, international scene and we look at the wars which are going on, I don't want to mention any names, but we can see the things which are happening right now. And there are people in power today and they think that they are very powerful and untouchable. But there's a living God behind all of this. He decides who's going to rise to power when, how long they will stay in power and when they are going to fall. The nations, even though they think that they are very great, actually have no control over what they are doing. In the sense, when the time comes for them to fall, they will fall because the living God decides what should be done when. And he knows how to watch out for his people and protect them. So even though you know so much um, uh, destruction had already started in the land of Judah, during the time of Josiah, God protects the people. God takes care of the people. Because during the time of Josiah, the people repented and came back to him. And so during that time, God speaks to them these words of hope and says, you know what? Nineveh came and attacked your cities. But you know what? Nineveh is going to fall one day. And when it falls, its destruction will be complete, is what the Lord you know, assures them. So this is what we see from the book of Nahum. Uh, let's move into the book of Habakkuk. Now, Habakkuk uh, was written um, also approximately around this time. So Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, uh, Habakkuk, all of these people were doing their prophesying around approximately the same time. Um, Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk is mainly known for the questions which Habakkuk asks God. If you look at most of the prophetic books, it's basically the prophet proclaiming and saying to the people, you know, you have sinned, uh, God is going to bring judgment upon you. Even now there is time. If you repent, the Lord will turn back. So that's the, that's the basic um, format which we see in most of the prophetic books. But here, 
in the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk is not even talking to the people. He's not even giving any prophecies to the people. Habakkuk is mainly a conversation between Habakkuk and God, where um, Habakkuk asks God questions, and in return, God gives him a set of prophecies. All right, so that's basically the format which we see here in the book of Habakkuk. Um, so uh, if we were to look at the structure of the book of Habakkuk, uh, chapter 1 up to chapter 2, verse 5, is where you have the first conversation. So Habakkuk 1 up to chapter 2, verse 5, is where you have Habakkuk asking a question and God giving an answer. So that's the first portion. And then after that, um, you have Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 5 onwards, where you have a second question which Habakkuk is asking, and God gives an answer to that as well. And then In the last portion of chapter 2, God talks about five things which he will do to the powerful nations which are not following him, including Babylon. Okay, so there are five judgments given. Uh, that is in the, in the second portion of chapter 2. And then finally, you have chapter 3, in which Habakkuk makes a prayer of submission to God. So you can basically divide this book of Habakkuk into three portions. The first portion is where... Habakkuk asks questions, God answers. The second portion, God says, don't worry, I will bring judgment upon all these powerful nations, you know, which are opposing me and, and are not submitting to me. And the third portion, Habakkuk just submits himself to God in prayer. Let's look at the questions which Habakkuk asks. Um, this is in the first portion. Uh, so if we could have someone read out for us Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to, out to you, violence, and you will not save. Habakkuk starts off with a question of frustration. He says, Lord, I've been crying out to you for help, and you are not listening. He says, I cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Because there's so much injustice happening, oh Lord, in this, in, in this land of Judah. So Lord, why don't you bring justice? Why don't you do something for the people? The poor are being exploited. The rich are becoming more and more arrogant. They think that nobody is going to judge them. And so they're doing whatever they want. But Lord, I'm crying out violence, violence, and Lord, you're not doing anything. So he, he asks God, Lord, when will you help us? When are you going to, you know, save us? And when he asks that question, uh, this is what the Lord says. The Lord says to him, don't worry, I'm raising up the Babylonians. The Babylonians, they will come and they'll attack and they'll bring judgment. So Habakkuk was hoping for some kind of divine solution where maybe God will, you know, uh, punish the evil people who are oppressing the poor and establish justice. But God is saying, I'll bring the Babylonians over here and they will um, act out the justice which I want to bring. So Habakkuk is very shocked and he raises the second question. He says, Lord, those Babylonians are worse than our people. Yes, it is true that I have been complaining and saying that, you know, the Israelite uh, officials are evil and they are oppressing the people. I'm saying that the judges are, you know, unjust. They are not giving justice. Yes, I have been complaining about these things. And I admit that they are evil. But Lord, you're saying you're going to use somebody even more evil to come and bring justice. How, Lord, how is this going to work? Because he says this about the character of God. Um, he says, uh, you, are, you are not a God who looks at injustice. Wait, let me find that uh, particular verse. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, if someone could read out. Habakkuk 1, 13. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal 
treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he. The, so, so God says, "Don't worry. I know what's going on. I have heard your prayers. Yes, violence is going on, but I will punish the people who are doing injustice. I will bring the Babylonians. The Babylonians will come and attack, and they will be destroyed." So now immediately Habakkuk says, "But Lord, you're such a pure and holy God. You cannot even look at impurity. So Lord." Why would you use somebody as evil as the Babylonians, people who are even worse than the Israelite people? Why, how are you going to use them? Such a, a dirty instrument, you know, such evil people. How, Lord, can you use somebody evil like that to bring about pure justice? Is what Habakkuk asks, and uh, this is what he says. Uh, in Habakkuk chapter one, verses fourteen to seventeen, he talks about how evil these Babylonian people are. He describes them, and so his basic question is: How can you use somebody so rotten for your holy purposes? You're a god of holiness. You're a god of righteous justice. How can you use something unclean to bring about? Good justice. So he talks about the uh, Babylonians and how evil they are in Habakkuk chapter one, verses fourteen to seventeen. Uh, if someone could read out that portion and look at the details which he uses, uh, look at the poetic language, the images which he uses to describe these Babylonian people and the evil which they are doing. Uh, Habakkuk chapter one, verses fourteen to seventeen. Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet, because by them their share is some potatoes and. They are food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations with, without pity? Habakkuk says, Lord, when you created people, you created them like the fish in the sea. They were meant to, you know, uh, swim around the entire ocean and be free and to enjoy uh, the life which you have given them. So people were meant to be like the, you know, sea creatures. Because the sea creatures don't have any government, they don't have any cruel king controlling them. You know, they're free. So Habakkuk says, when you created people, O oh Lord, that's the way you wanted people to enjoy. But then, what did these Babylonians do? They are like, you know, he's using the image of fish. So he says, these Babylonians, they pull, pull, pull up the people with their hooks. They gather them up with their dragnet. He's using the, you know, language of fishing. He's talking about how these Babylonians came along, and he took this free people, and he began, uh, and and the, these Babylonian kings began to hook them, you know, the way you hook fish. Uh, they began to throw their net and collect all the people as captives, you know, the same way we capture the fish in a net. So he says, this is what the Babylonian people have done, and they don't even acknowledge you. Rather than saying the living God has allowed us to have victory, what are they doing? They are making sacrifices to their dragnet. You know, like as if the net has brought them the victory, like as if their their weapons have brought them victory. But it's actually you, the living God, who's allowing it, and they don't even acknowledge that. Lord, how can you allow people like that to continue destroying? You know, is the question which he asks. And so he says in Habakkuk chapter two, verse one. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what God will say to me and what answer I am going to give to this complaint. So Habakkuk is very, very troubled by what God has said. He wants to know how God can use evil things to bring about good. And so he says, you know, I'm literally going to stand on the city walls. Of course, he's using metaphoric language. You know, he's saying it's like, you know, I'm going to stand on the city walls and I'm going to wait. You know, the way, uh, the way, uh, you know, the uh, when, when during times of battle, the king waits on the battle wall to see, you know, if any messenger is coming to bring news about what's going to happen. So he says, "I'll wait. I'll wait on the city walls and see what answer God is going to give me for my question." 
And this is what the Lord um, says. This is what the Lord replies. Now, before we look at the reply which God gives, it's a question which you know many of us might have raised in our own lives, where we say, Lord, the evil are getting stronger. The, the, the wicked people are prospering. But we who are following you, you know, we are undergoing so much suffering. Why, Lord? A holy God like you, whose eyes are pure and who does not like to look upon evil, why, Lord, are you permitting these things? That's a question which many of us have asked. And so like this Habakkuk, we are standing on the city wall, waiting eagerly to see whether God will give some reply, whether God will give some answer to our, to our very honest, desperate question. And this is the answer which God gave to Habakkuk. And this is the answer which God gives even to us believers today. Let us look at what God says. So if someone could read out for us Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2 up to verse 4. Habakkuk 2, 2 to 4. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the wisdom and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who, who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live, live by his faith. God says, the answer which I am giving is a true answer. No, get the tablets ready because when I'm going to give you the answer, it's going to be an answer which will really, you know, be genuine. So, you know, get ready to write it down and send it to all you know, different places with messengers because who knows how many people are waiting on their city walls, waiting to hear what God is going to say regarding this. So it's like, you know, all this is poetic language which he is using to talk about. God is trying to say, you know, there are people definitely waiting, many people who are waiting for an answer from me. Because we believers are asking and saying, Lord, why so much injustice, Lord? When are you going to do something good, O oh Lord? When will you set your people free, O oh Lord? You know, people are crying out. So he says, write it down. Write it down on tablets and send the messages to give the mes uh, message which I am conveying. And this is the message which I wish to convey. And this is what God says. Um, For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. God says the things which I am going to do, they will happen in the end time. And when they happen in the end time, every word that I'm saying will take place. Not one word which I'm saying will be proved false. All that I have promised I will do, I will bring it to pass. And he goes on to say, though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. So God says, in my timing, I will grant justice. In my timing, my people will receive the help which they require. In my timing, you know, even though it looks like as if it is getting delayed, he says, though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. In my perfect appointed time, without delay, I will do the things which I am promising for my people. So, this is a, these are words which are very important, not just you know for the people of Habakkuk's time. They are for us as well. And this is what it says in verse 4, where God says, The enemy is very puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by his faith. You know, and it says in, in some versions, by his faithfulness. So we will look at this in greater detail, you know, when we come back from our break, because what God is saying over here is very, very important for our Christian walk. All right. So um, we can go for our break now. Yeah.